In the previous two videos, we looked at how the triune God is taught in the Old and New Testament. So now we're going to look at some objections from Scripture that Unitarians bring up and deal with them appropriately. The first objection comes from Proverbs 8. In this chapter, Solomon is speaking how glorious wisdom is, but many Unitarians point out that wisdom is being spoken about as if wisdom is an actual person. They then draw a parallel to John chapter 1, where Christ is called the Word, and say that the personification of wisdom in Proverbs 8 is actually Jesus. And Proverbs 8.22 says wisdom was created. So Jesus cannot be the eternal God, since it directly says he was created. However, despite this claim being an obvious leap by Unitarians, there are other problems with the idea this chapter is about Jesus. The first thing to note is the word Unitarians interpret as create doesn't necessarily mean create. The Hebrew word used when God creates is bara, but here we see a Hebrew word which can be used to mean several things, like possess or own. So it is not explicit that God created something or someone here. Also, there's not enough evidence this passage is even talking about Jesus. If we conclude that wisdom is an actual being, rather than a mere personification of a virtue, then we would have to conclude that prudence is also a being. Verse 12 says, I wisdom dwell with prudence. We should also conclude that instruction is a being as well. Proverbs 4.13 says, Take firm hold of instruction, do not let go, keep her, for she is your life. If wisdom is understood to be a created being because it is personified, then we have to conclude that every time Solomon personifies a virtue, he is speaking of a created being. In actuality, Solomon uses poetic personification for the desirableness of wisdom so he can compare it to the desirableness of women. That is why wisdom is personified and given feminine pronouns, and this is not uncommon in Jewish literature. In the Bible, there are other places where abstract qualities are personified, following an ancient Eastern tradition of personification. Larry W. Hurtado says, the idea of wisdom being an independent deity here is simply unwarranted and imports into such passages connotations never intended by the writers. So the next objection comes from Acts 20:28. 20, it says, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Now the Holy Spirit didn't purchase us with his blood, Jesus did. So does this verse teach modalism and show that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are the same person? No, but this is a good example of the difficulties translators faced. The he in Greek is referring to God or Lord, not the Holy Spirit. His own blood can equally be translated as the blood of his own. So in the Greek, this verse is not modalist. Now another objection I hear is regarding my video on the Trinity in the Old Testament. I make the claim that the figure known as the angel of the Lord is the person of Christ in the Old Testament. Yet in the New Testament, the phrase angel of the Lord is used to refer to ordinary angels. So can we be sure the angel of the Lord is actually a person of God in the Old Testament? Yes, because it's not about the phrase, it's about the surrounding context. Furthermore, the New Testament was written in a different time period to a different audience in a different language, so the phrase will obviously not be used the same way it was in the Old Testament. What about Acts chapter 7? Verse 30 says an angel appeared to Moses in the burning bush. Stephen doesn't say it was God who appeared to Moses. Well, like Hebrew, the word for angel simply means messenger. It doesn't specifically mean angel. But also, Stephen never implies or explicitly says God was speaking through an ordinary angel. In fact, in the next two verses, he says God spoke to Moses in the bush, and Moses dared not to look, which means that both Stephen and Moses understood God appeared to him, since Moses was afraid to die from seeing God. Moreover, in verse 38, Stephen says that the angel who appeared to Moses in the bush was also the figure who was with Moses on Mount Sinai. So Stephen doesn't contradict Exodus 3 and say it was an ordinary angel that appeared to Moses. He just is not as explicit as the passage he is quoting. What about the book of Jude? Verse 9 says Michael was disputing with Satan and said to him, The Lord rebuke you. Which seems to indicate that Jude was quoting Zechariah 3 and saying that the angel that Zechariah saw rebuke Satan was actually Michael and not God himself. Well actually this is not the case. Jude is referring to an apocrypha book known as the Assumption of Moses. He doesn't mention important figures from Zechariah 3, like the high priest Joshua or the prophet Zechariah. So Jude is not referring to Zechariah 3. He might be borrowing language, but there is no evidence to say he is quoting it. Now some skeptics try to make the claim that Jesus and Michael the Archangel are the same being, but I find this hard to believe 
because there's no implication in scripture and Hebrews 1 directly contradicts the idea that an angel can be the son of God. Verse 5 and 6 say, For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. So Jesus cannot be a created angel because angels are not the children of God. And just so my viewers know, the author defines angels here specifically as ministering spirits. So it is explicit he is talking about actual angels and not just messengers of some sort. Another verse used to say Michael and Jesus are the same is 1 Thessalonians 4.16, which says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. However, this verse does not explicitly say Jesus is an archangel. First off, skeptics are completely ignoring the power of the preposition with. This Greek preposition is usually used to denote accompanied by someone or something. It is not used to describe. For example, it would be used if I would say in Greek, I'm with my family. It would not be used to say, I'm filled with joy. On top of that, the structure of the sentence is worded in such a manner that when Christ returns, he will be accompanied with these things. If the voice of the archangel is Jesus' actual voice, then we also have to conclude that the trumpet of God is also describing Jesus, since it uses the same Greek preposition and sentence structure. But that wouldn't make sense in Greek or English. Besides, 2 Thessalonians 1.7 says, Jesus will be revealed from heaven with angels. So it seems Jesus is coming with angels, not that he is coming as an angel. What about Jesus being called the firstborn? Does this imply he was born at some point? No, because if you look at Colossians 1, we see that Paul teaches Jesus is the firstborn in privilege, not first created. Plus, the Greek word used for firstborn doesn't mean oldest child, it means priority. In ancient cultures, the firstborn was not necessarily the oldest child. Firstborn referred not to the birth order, but to the rank. The firstborn possessed the inheritance and leadership. So in Jesus being the firstborn, it doesn't mean he is the first created. This is why understanding the language and the culture the Bible was written in is very important. Now what about things Jesus said and did during his ministry? Doesn't Jesus pray to the Father? So was Jesus praying to himself? No, because prayer is defined as talking with God. And since the persons of the Trinity are not different modes of one God, there is nothing incoherent about one member of the Trinity talking to another. So Jesus was simply praying or talking with the Father. Doesn't Jesus say the Father is greater than him in John 14, 28? Yes, but that doesn't mean the Father is greater in power or essence. The Greek word for greater can be used to mean greater in quantity, essence, or position. And there are several passages where Jesus claimed to be equal with the Father in essence. Jesus is pointing out the same thing Paul points out in 1 Corinthians 11:3, that Jesus willingly submits to the Father in rank. And there is nothing odd about Jesus submitting to the Father's leadership. Two persons cannot lead. And there is nothing incoherent about the Father being the lead and the Son submitting to his leadership and position. St. John Chrysostom said concerning this, If anyone say that the Father is greater insofar as he is the cause of the Son, we will not gainsay this. But this, however, does not make the Son to be of different essence. So John 14, 28 says the Father is greater in position, not essence, which is in line with the rest of Scripture. It is also important to remember that Hebrews 2.9 says that Christ was made lower than the angels when he was made human. Philippians 2.5-7 says Jesus was equal with God, but willingly became a man, humbled himself, and became obedient, showing that while Jesus was on earth, he was dependent on the Father since he had to cooperate with the limitations of being human. After his resurrection, he was once again fully divine. So many other objections can be answered by a misunderstanding of Jesus' hypostatic union and that he cooperated with the limitations of being human. Now obviously there are dozens of other objections to the Trinity, and we certainly cannot cover them all, but the most frequently used objections can be easily dealt with, as I have just done. And I want to point out that if someone claims the Bible teaches Unitarianism, then the burden of proof is really on them, because they first have to explain away the countless verses I've already used to show that the Trinity is in the New Testament and in the Old Testament.